Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. This is our final community event, um, community at Concordia event for the season, and we want to say thank you to so many of you who turned out often in the wee hours of the morning or in the cold of night um, to join us for the various events that we've had here this season. Um, as we commemorate National Holocaust Remembrance Day, we gather here tonight to hear the story of a family of Polish Jews whose love for one another demonstrated that the human spirit cannot be broken even in the darkest and deadliest of circumstances. Similar to Yvette Manessis Corcoran, our guest author in February, Georgia Hunter heard a story from her grandparent and decided it was a story she had to tell. We Were the Lucky Ones began as a research project for the then 15-year-old Georgia. As she sat with her grandmother, Caroline, eager to learn more about her beloved grandfather, Eddie, who had recently passed away from Parkinson's disease, this story began to unfold. What Georgia learned surprised her at first. Her grandfather's name wasn't Eddie Quartz, but actually Adolf Kurtz, who was called Addie by his family. She didn't know he was the middle of five children, born in Poland and raised in a town with more than 30,000 Jews. She didn't know he was in Paris at the outbreak of the war, emigrated to Brazil, and was separated from his family for nearly a decade, not knowing if they survived or not. What she learned astonished and excited her. And the tale of Addie and his siblings soon became her passion and purpose to share with the rest of the world. We Were the Lucky Ones takes its reader on the journey of the Kurtz family, beginning in pre-war Poland and Europe, through to the end of the war and beyond. As a reader, you become obsessed with the characters, Addie, Jenik, and Herta, Jacob and Bella, Helena and Adam, Myla, Felicia, and Salim, and Saul and Nuchama, as they overcome the most horrific conditions, determined to survive and be together again. It is a page-turning story you don't want to put down, written with such detail that you find yourself living in their world, feeling their pain, your own heart beating faster and faster as danger lurks around every corner. It is truly a book you don't want to finish because you want to be part of the Kurtz family for a lifetime. Recently released in paperback, We Were the Lucky Ones spent 14 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. The book enjoys international acclaim as well, having been translated into several languages. It is an honor tonight to hear from this wonderful young woman who has poured her heart and soul into this story so we too could share the journey with her family. Please join me in welcoming Georgia Hunter. Joyce, thank you. I, can you introduce me everywhere? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was such a nice introduction. And thank you for having me here tonight. And what a special night on Holocaust Remembrance Day to be standing um, in a room full of amazing people and talking about my family's story. Um, they were the lucky ones, but I you know I've been thinking all day today, um, remembering those that were not so lucky. So. I'm honored to be here today. Thank you all for coming. And um, a special thank you to my mom in the audience for coming tonight, too. She's my wing woman throughout this project, start to finish. Um, she's Addie's, my, you know, my grandfather's Addie, her, his middle child. So if you have any questions, uh, <laughs> feel free to ask. <laughs> um, I'd be curious to know, has anybody read the book yet? Oh. Wow, that's a lot, that's amazing. Um, well, for those who haven't, I'll try not to give too much away. Um, and, and in a nutshell, um, this book, We Were the Lucky Ones, tracks my grandfather, Addie, his siblings, and his parents as they scatter, this family of Polish Jews, as they scatter at the start of the Second World War on a twofold mission, first to survive, and second to reunite. Um, it's a, a story, a book that took me nine years from start to finish to research and record. Um, and, and I find that in my talks, I often get asked about that process just as much as I get asked about the, the story itself. 
So um, today, what I thought I would do is to kind of give you a peek behind the curtain of the story behind the story um, of my own personal journey in discovering and researching and recording um, this piece of my family history that, um, as Joyce mentioned, I had no idea existed until I was well into my teens. So pipe up if you have questions. We'll definitely have some Q&A at the end. Um, I brought some family photos and documents that I found throughout my research, and um, I'm excited to show you those. And, on, and in the end, I'll, I'll read a, a couple of very short passages. Um, but to begin, I'll talk, I want to show you this photograph of uh, me with my grandfather, Addy, um, at age one. So the interesting piece of of my grandfather's story to me, the beginning, was that um, I had no idea it existed. I, I knew him as, as Eddie, I knew him as an American, as he had become when he got to the States. I never detected a Polish accent. Um, I, looking back, you might say, I, I might say I could attribute some of his quirks to his Europeanness. Um, you know, he was very resourceful. He made a lot of the things in his home by hand. Um, for instance, the curtains hanging in the living room, he wove them by hand on a loom that he built by hand in the basement. Um, he had these clay busts of his children that he had uh, molded by hand from a photograph that his brother Jacob took. Um, he had this contraption. He was a very neat and clean guy. He had this contraption in, in the bathroom where he hung the, his bar of soap from a magnet over the sink because he didn't like when it got slimy in the soap dish. Um, so there were these little things that I guess looking back there was always music playing. Turns out a lot of times it was either his own or Chopin. I knew he loved to compose. Um, but I grew up a mile from Eddie, Addie, and my grandmother Caroline, and, and we celebrated birthdays and holidays and had family meals, and, and yet his Holocaust era past was just not a part of our dialogue. It was a piece of his story that he had chosen to put behind him. Um, so it wasn't until I was 15 years old uh, when a high school English teacher assigned our class a project called an eye search that this piece of his story came to light. Our assignment was to go out and interview a family member, a relative, to learn a little bit about our roots and in turn about ourselves. And my grandfather had passed away the year before, so I decided to sit down with my grandmother, Caroline. And this is the, this is the paper that came of that project, my, uh, my eye search it's called. Um, I'll never forget that interview. Uh, for many reasons, and I have such vivid memories of sitting down with my grandmother in her home near, you know, a mile from mine in Massachusetts. We were sitting by the window. She used to love, she had this beautiful um, silvery long hair at the time, and she used to love when I would French braid it. So I remember sitting by the window and braiding her hair and talking, and over the course of an hour, discovering that I was a quarter Polish Jewish and that I came from this family of Holocaust survivors. Obviously it came as quite a shock, um, but I wasn't resentful, I wasn't angry, um, I was just intensely curious. I had a thousand questions, my poor grandmother, I, I peppered her over and over again. I wanted to know what, um, how is this possible? How did my grandfather survive? How did the family survive? And she did explain, she was familiar with my grandfather's side of the story, which was that he was the only one of his siblings living in France at the start of the war. Um, and that early on in the war, or before the war actually began, September of 39, he got a letter, this was in the springtime from his mother saying, hey, it's becoming a little dangerous here. I, I feel like maybe for the first time in your life, he was 26 years old, I feel like you should stay in France for Passover. We should, you should just remain there. And, and he, his story was that, what he told my mother was that that was the first time he realized these clouds of war were real. This threat was real. And sure enough, he wasn't able to make it home, even though he tried. And he figured out a way to get out of Europe on a boat full of refugees with an illegal visa. So my grandmother explained this piece of his story. He ended up in Brazil. She was a little fuzzy on how exactly he ended up in Brazil. And once he got there, he lost complete contact with his family. She did also mention that 
on the ship that took him from France to Brazil, or so she thought, uh, he met a young lady, a young woman, a uh, Czechoslovakian, who he was engaged to be married to. Um, luckily, it didn't work out. Um, I, my mom and I wouldn't be here today, but she remembered her name, and she told me about this woman, and that they made it, and they got to Brazil. And I said, well, what about the family in Poland? How did they survive? Because I knew enough in my Holocaust studies that surely the odds were against them. And she said, you know, I met your grandfather's family after the war, and like your grandfather, they rarely spoke about that time in their lives. So I would wait another five years before I got a few more answers to my many, many questions. And that happened at a family reunion that my mother organized at our home in Massachusetts. Um, for those of you who have read the book, I think I pushed here. This is my grandmother, Caroline, the matriarch in the middle here. Um, and this is Felicia. Felicia was a year old at the start of the war, and she's one of the main characters in the book. She, she is still alive, and uh, when I set off in my research, was the only relative um, who was living who still had firsthand, who had firsthand memories. Um, so my mother's one of ten first cousins on my grandfather's side. She invited them all, and they immediately agreed to come. They flew in from Brazil and France, Israel, across the states, north and south. We were, I think, 32 in all with spouses and children, and we spent this incredible week together. Um, uh, you know, everybody under one roof. We shared meals. There was music, and it was purely chaotic. Um, lots of different kinds of food being prepared. And I met cousins I'd never met, um, and, and it was incredible. You can see we all look pretty different. <laughs> um, and one night during this reunion, I was 21, I had just graduated from college, and um, one night at the reunion, I wandered outside onto the back porch where my mom and her cousins were gathered, um, and I sat down on a picnic bench next to my Aunt Kath, and, and just listened, and I realized, oh, they're telling stories about my grandfather and about the war. And I leaned in, and I you know, tried to keep up as the conversation kind of shifted languages frequently. Um, but little by little, I started to, um, I was introduced to the greater Kirk family story, bits and pieces of it. Um, for example, Jose was there. Jose is one of my mother's cousins. He was born in Siberia, and he talked about how he had no idea why his parents had been sent there. He just knew, and he didn't even know when he was, the day of he was born. He didn't know his birthday. He said his mother just told him it was so cold in the dead of the Siberian winter when he was born that as a baby he would wake with his eyes frozen shut and she would have to coax them open with her breast milk. Another cousin talked about how her parents hiked over the Austrian Alps to safety um, and how her mother had been pregnant at the time. Another cousin talked about how his parents had been uh, married at the early years of the war in Lvov in a very illegal and very dangerous wedding where they convinced a rabbi to come out of hiding and marry them. And they had this very small um, gathering in a blacked out home with these two candles and, uh, and they just couldn't wait any longer, apparently. I heard about false IDs and disguised circumcisions and an attempted escape from the ghetto, mother-daughter escape. And I, the stories just kept coming and unfolding, and I remember sitting there thinking, how have I never heard these stories before? How, how am I just hearing them now for the first time? And how has no one taken the time to write them down? And I can't say I, I, I went to bed that night knowing, okay, that, that'll be me <laughs> to write them down. Um, but I think the idea was seeded, and I couldn't quite let it go. Um, and it stayed with me for another eight years, um, kind of a spark, and finally until I couldn't ignore it any longer. And so uh, in 2008, I put a stake in the ground and I said, okay, this is something I'm going to do. I called or emailed all the relatives. They said, may I come interview you? They all, it was resounding, yes, so much support. Everybody wanted the story, felt like the story should be told. Um, so in 2008, I was in Seattle, living in Seattle with my now husband, and I set off for my first interview in, in Paris. And this is um, a map showing you my research travels, which was part of the reason I think I was a little bit intimidated um, to, to put that stake in the ground, because I knew it was going to entail a lot of travel. We were a very global family. 
Um, so first stop was Paris to interview Felicia. This is Felicia on the right with her husband Louis and my husband Robert. And I spent several days with her in her home, a beautiful apartment overlooking the Eiffel Tower, and, and hearing stories that were heartbreaking, heartwarming. Um, and I was just in awe. It was in my mid 20s and I couldn't I didn't have children yet but I was just in awe of how she was able to remember um, s these events that happened at such an early age again she was one year old at the start of the war so her entire childhood was consumed with knowing nothing else but being in hiding being hunted seeing this the horrors unfolding around her that interview was very moving obviously and I took a lot of time and was very gentle uh, in my approach um, with her and I'm so grateful for the time that she spent with me. From there um, my next trip was to Brazil to Rio de Janeiro and here I am with uh, another one of my mother's cousins so second generation survivor Michel. He's the younger son of Genic and Herta. Um, many of the families ended up once they reunited in Brazil they ended up staying in Brazil so we have a lot of family there and this way we traveled and visited old addresses and walked in my grandfather's footsteps and and went to the archives found incredible records through the National Archives and and this bay is called Guanabara Bay and there's an important scene in the book that is set right here um, and I, I remember standing there and thinking from my grandfather's perspective what it must have felt like um, for that Seen to unfold in, in real life, um, and this that was it was amazing spending time with that second generation, a generation over me, because I would never have gotten to know that these cousins had I not embarked on this this research, and I felt like also through them, just I would ask. Obviously, I wanted to know the details of how the family, how their parents survived, but I also wanted to know what kind of people they were, and so I'd ask a lot of kind of odd questions like. What, was their, what were their quirks? What were their favorite sayings? What annoyed you about them? What were they, what, did they hum anything in particular? You know, they, did they smoke? Did they, what was their favorite fruit? Um, so it was a lot of fun kind of getting to know these, the Kirk siblings who you meet in the book through their children. <laughs> this is my husband and we are on um, Copacabana Beach here on Avenida Atlantica. And I'll talk about this in a few minutes, uh, my decision in the end to fictionalize the book as opposed to writing it as nonfiction. Um, but there were certain aspects of the story um, as my research unfolded, I, I was able to collect through oral histories this very solid foundation, the bones of who was where and when. But there were certain pieces that were missing that I felt were important to me and would be important to a reader. For example, what when my grandfather finally made it to Brazil, I discovered the ship that had left Marseille never made it. It was actually bombed. He, it, luckily, he wasn't on it. He was meant to arrive in two weeks. It took six months. He had an expired illegal visa. He was actually detained on an island outside of Brazil for several weeks. What would it have felt like to walk on Brazilian soil as a free man for the first time that day, that first day, after six months of leaving everything and everyone behind? He'd fallen in love, he's engaged. What, what did they do? What did he and his fiance do at the time? And I didn't know. That wasn't a story that was passed down to me. So if you read the book, there's a scene where, uh, where Addie and Aliska take off on their first day in Rio, and I decided to um, revolve that around what Robert and I did on our first day in Rio, <laughs> which was walk up and down this beautiful promenade, which I knew the mosaics existed at the time, um, and we, we tried our first sip of real coconut water. So Addie and Elise go walk along Avenida Atlantica and sip coconut water on their first day in Rio. <clears throat> Once I ran out of family members to interview, I tried to get creative about who else might have a story to share that might shed light on, on my family's um, journey. And I knew my grandmother had talked a lot about this ex-fiance, Eliska. She had called her Elizabeth Lobier. And um, I'd actually found a book about an ambassador, a Brazilian ambassador who was issuing mostly Jewish refugees illegal visas in Vichy, France. My grandfather, turns out, was one of them. So I found this book. It's in Portuguese. I had a relative help me translate it. And in the back, sure enough, my grandfather's name was listed as one of these refugees that um, this ambassador, Salza Dantas, helped. And as I was scrolling through the names, I saw two names that looked 
well, at least one of them looked familiar, and I knew from my grandmother's story that Eliska was traveling with her mother, that they were, the two of them were traveling. So I saw um, Eliska and Gustava Lobiroa in, on this list of names, and I thought, well, that has, that's a, can't be a coincidence. That sounds just like Elizabeth Lobier. And sure enough, through the web, I was able to find um, Eliska listed in her, by her maiden, maiden name in a church newsletter in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I wrote her a letter, and she called me the day it arrived and said, of course I remember your grandfather. Please come visit me. I would love to meet you. Bring your mother. So my mother and I flew down and spent two days with Eliska here. Um, this was us me, on our trip, and she had photos. This was her at the, the, probably 18 when she met my grandfather, and she was just, her memories were so sharp and so vivid. And um, her eyes definitely still lit up when she talked about my grandfather. <laughs> there, there were too many fireworks, she said, in the one eye. Well, why didn't it work out with you guys? But she adored my grandfather, and she had photographs and documents. She, she even had my grandfather, one of his first jobs when he got to Brazil, which he had to do work under the table until his work permit cleared, was binding books um, out of leather by hand. She had two of his hand-bound leather books and gave us one. Um, she and just 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 sitting with her and hearing through, you know, her stories, getting this little window into what it was like not only to be on the run, leaving everything and everyone behind, but to be falling in love with my grandfather and what their days were like, what what they how they snuck off the ship and found these deserted beaches in Dakar, and then what how they managed to get from Casablanca up to Spain and Spain to Brazil. I mean, it was a wealth of information, and just more importantly, from the discoveries of the, how they got from A to B to C, what was it like from a human perspective? Like, what did it feel like? Um, so she was so generous with her time. She has since passed. She passed quietly in her sleep and, and a happy, happy woman. She has children, and um, it, was, it was a very special few days that we got to spend with her. After my oral history uh, felt like it was complete, I decided that I would reach out to some outside resources. There were still a few gaps in my story that I needed to fill. So I had my, organized my research in the beginning in the form of a timeline, which I color-coded by sibling, because it got, it was a lot of information. As you know, if you've tried to follow along in the book, there are many characters. This, the, the whole story is this whole family trying to survive. So I've got this timeline, it's color-coded. I peppered in some historical context, mostly for my own sake. In the beginning, it ended up staying in the book in between chapters because it was so helpful to me to know what was going on at the time. Um, so if I knew that a particular sibling was in a particular place at a particular time, I might reach out to, say, the Ministry of Moscow or the Ministry of Defense in the UK or records in Paris, Rio, every, anywhere they had been, which often meant hiring a translator to write a letter, sent those letters out, and sometimes it would take months. This letter came back from the Memorial Center in Moscow 11 months after I had sent it. But sure enough, they had a date and a name um, of, of record of Ginnick and where he had been in a, on a particular piece of his journey. Um, and so little by little, the records came back, and I was amazed at what I was able to find. Um, there are so many records being digitalized every day um, today and moving forward also. I almost want to go back and do this again because I know how much effort is being made to preserve these records. Um, through the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, I found this nine-page handwritten account by my great-uncle Genick, the one who was sent to Siberia. And in this account, he writes, he explains the day he and his wife Herta were arrested why they were arrested in Lvov, where they were sent exactly in Siberia, the name of the camp, what they were meant forced to do there, the day their son Jose was born, so now Jose has a birthday, um, what, their daily to what they were doing every day, why they were eventually granted amnesty and released, and what the year-long journey to then join the army, which was essentially their only option, what that entailed. It was a, like a pot of gold, this document, and really special to see his handwriting, and even more special to pass it on to his family, 
this document, but also the story. It's all this huge gap in the family story that, that we hadn't, we, we just didn't, nobody knew because his parents, these Genick and Herta, never spoke about it. I also found because a couple of relatives joined the army, um, the Polish army fell under the wing of the British army, and there were meticulous records um, through the UK Ministry of Defense. So through them, I was able to track who was where and what battles they fought in. For example, I, I discovered that two relatives had fought in the Battle of Monte Cassino, which I didn't know much about at the time, but I understand now was a very pivotal um, victory for the Allies, especially for the Polish army in particular. Um, and I also discovered that there were several unclaimed medals of honor, um, and I was able to claim those medals that these family members had earned and, and also pass those on to the, to the children. So outside research, when that part felt complete, the oral history was complete, my bones, the bones of the story were there, then came the question, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> How do I bring this timeline, essentially, to life? And I had to constantly reconcile, you know, what I had discovered and also the images that I had in my mind with how I wanted the story to read. For example, I had several, um, photographs and documents. I had this picture of my grandfather, Addy, who spent a short, very short stint in a Polish column of the French army before he got out of France. And I had this sheet music. This was one of his compositions called Liszt, which I talk about a lot in the book. It made him a little famous before the war. It was sung by a, an artist named Vera Gran. I had this picture that I found online of the boat that never ended up making it, but that he boarded in Marseille, thinking he was going to two weeks later wind up in Rio, it's called the Alcina, boat full of musicians it turned out where he met his ex-fiancee. I had, um, this was an incredible document through um, Helena's children that I was passed, uh, that I was given, and this was her false ID. So as you can see, she chose the name Brazoza um, instead of Cork, K-U-R-C, which is our family name. And um, she, you can't quite tell in this photograph, she was, of all the siblings, the lightest hair, the lighter eyes. And this was the document that allowed her to live outside uh, work camps and ghetto walls. And I'm certain was um, instrumental in keeping her and some of the other family members alive. I just love her expression in that photo, too. Such confidence. She was the youngest of the siblings, but she, um, I'm told, had the most kind of bravado. This photograph um, was passed down through Jacob's son, Victor, and this was taken by Jacob, who was a photographer in trade. He's my grandfather's younger brother. Um, this was after the war, and this is his wife, Bella, and there's baby Victor, their, child, their, little, their little baby. And they're boarding a train in Poland, actually headed to Germany, where they're um, going to a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart where their hope is that they'll get a visa to get to the States. So um, they, they, Bella's had a relative in the States, and they were hoping for sponsorship. And there's a scene in the book where um, they're boarding this train, and Jacob steps off the train and snaps a photo. If I had a piece of music, if I had a photograph, a false ID, this, this is one example, I would try to bring that to life exactly as it looked in, in my hands. This is another photograph that, that still kind of haunts me, but this was one that I found of the entrance to the ghetto gates in the town of Rodham, where the family was from, in central Poland. Um, and I knew that Mila, my grandfather's oldest sister, had attempted to escape through these gates. I knew the whole family at one point was confined in the ghetto. So I had to constantly ask myself, how do I want this story to come across? And in my mind, it was very black and white, I had the sepia toned images, these very dark images. Just knowing the statistics alone um, gave me a very um, kind of haunted perspective. My, this town of Rodham, as um, Joyce mentioned, had 30,000 Jews who made up a third of the population before the war, after there were fewer than 300 survivors, 1%. So just that alone shaded my perspective. But I constantly reminded myself that even though we can look back on this time and we know what happened and we have these statistics and we have these images, the family, when they were living day to day, 
they were living it in color. They were feeling, they had feelings, emotions. Not only were they living the darkness, they were also, as I learned in my research, they were also falling in love. They were making music. They were having babies. So there was this very constant light and dark, the both extremes, and I decided that it was really important to me to tell the story as if I was in their shoes, so that readers, especially for my kids and their kids someday and future generations, could step into those shoes and not just see but feel and imagine what it would have felt like at the time to experience this. Because the Holocaust sadly will feel like ancient history soon, especially for my kids. And I, and I wanted to tell the story in a way that felt relevant and visceral and colorful and very human. And so in the end, that's what prompted my decision to write it as fiction and allow myself the creative license to create those details. What were they thinking? What were they feeling? What were they saying? Um, and and the, what was the setting? What were these, these details that weren't passed down in my research that I, in oral histories at least, but that I was able to use the lens. Could it have been this way for everything that I have done it, to uncover the story? Could it have happened this way? And if the answer was yes, then I allowed myself to, to write it that way. And who knows, maybe in the end, those extra details brought the story to life in a way that's closer to the truth. Then sometimes even the stories that were passed down were also told in black and white and almost anecdotally. Even though I had, I forgot to mention, I had access to a couple of Shoah interviews, which I'm sure you're familiar with the Shoah Foundation, Steven Spielberg's initiative, where he put survivors in front of cameras to record their stories. I had three relatives, so I could see and hear firsthand their, their experiences. But even those stories were told with such distance. Oh, and then we were crawling across the field. I was crawling across the field on my hands and knees, and there were gunshots, but I kept going. Or oh, we were in the back of a... a a truck hiding behind some supplies and, and they were shooting at us, but we, we made it across the border. Oh, and then my mother dropped me out of the window inside, stuffed into a mattress, uh, but that plan didn't work, so I was returned to the ghetto. So even the stories that were passed down were done so in a way that, you know, ha had some distance and in a way that felt black and white. So I hope that if you picked up the story or if you have read it, that it came across as um, a more human, very personal account. That was my goal in, in writing it. Um, and the last piece of my research, which was also very important to me, was to travel to Eastern Europe and then through Italy. I wanted to physically follow in the footsteps of the Kirk family. Um, they had scattered, their paths were uh, they ended up on five different continents over the years, um, but I knew the European piece uh, well enough and I wanted to go from um, Poland through Czech Republic um, into Austria down along the coast of Italy. And so for two summers, that's what I did. Um, my husband, bless his heart, um, was fully supportive of it. We spent, instead of going to some nice beach, we did like weeks, a week of very intense travel through Eastern Europe. Um, and I, and I immediately, you know, my first, and I was most excited slash nervous to see Rodham, this town where the family was from. Um, again, the statistics were in my mind. Um, I knew that no one in the family had wanted to return to Rodham, and, you know, once they had left, they wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but it was important for me to go, and I had this image in my mind. And I want to show you this next photograph is of this very exact same street corner where the ghetto gates once stood. So this is what it looks like today. So as you can see, my first impression of this town, city of Rodham, was of actually how beautiful it was. It felt quaint and livable. It was, you know, there were cobblestone streets and wrought iron balconies and beautiful flowers. And we just, we felt welcome. And um, I was struck for the first time with this sense of understanding. I, I, I got it. I understood why my great grandparents, Saul and Nahuma, had chosen to live there. Because for a while, I was like, why would they have lived there? Why have they stayed there? But to be honest, it didn't feel all that different from Rowayton, where I live today, from a small town in New England. I could see what life was, would have been like before their worlds were turned upside down. This was the, our, the uh, family's, the entranceway to the family's old apartment building. Did a lot of hanging out there. <laughs> People probably thought I was a little weird, but I kind of walked in and out and in and out and 
and imagined them doing the same thing. And it was, I recommend, if anybody has the chance to go stand physically in the footsteps of where your ancestors once stood, it's a very powerful thing. I also had this other impression, and this one I kind of knew I would have, of, of, it felt like there were ghosts around me. I felt um, this sort of chilling sense um, in a couple examples of how is this was a rendering of the town synagogue, which um, you know everybody, the Jewish population frequented, and it was once a in the, stood in the center of town. And during the war, it was raised by by the Nazis, and first of all, it was turned into a stable, and then it was burned to the ground. And today, it's just an empty square. Um, there was also this Jewish cemetery. We were. We were taken around by a guide, Jacob, who was, I found through the cultural center there, and he was very adamant about showing us the Jewish cemetery outside of town, and I found this photograph. It was actually a postcard of what it looked like before the war. As you can see, um, it was beautiful. There was you know, lots and lots of headstones, and it must have been a source of pride for it to be on a postcard. And today, it's, um, you know, there are very, very few headstones left. It's barely kept up. And um, Jacob, our guide, explained that during the war, the headstones were ripped up again by the Nazis to make an airstrip outside of town. So I had this you know, double experience of understanding and, ha and being able to visualize what life might have been like and why my family had chosen to live there, and also this very kind of haunting, chilling experience of you know, what once was. And the following summer, my husband and Robert and I went back and we took our son Wyatt, who was four at the time, and we did the Italian piece of um, the Kirk family journey. And this was less research intense, but it was a lot of fun. And we traveled exactly the path that they traveled, one way down the Adriatic coast, with making a few important stops, for example, um, at the train station in Bari, Italy, which is in Puglia, the southern region, um, where I knew the family, um, many family members had been. And I knew that my great aunt Mila had been there with her daughter, young daughter, and just walking the platform with, with Wyatt and hearing the chirp of Italian on the loudspeakers and watching the trains come and go. Um, and imagining again through their eyes what it might have felt like some 75 years before to be there was, was very moving. Wyatt was mo mostly concerned with the gelato that we promised him afterwards, <laughs> but, um, but it was really special to have him there with us. So I'll read a couple quick passages if that's okay and then answer some questions. So this first passage um, the, the chapters are written from different perspectives because, as I mentioned, each sibling really had his or her own path to survival. Um, so they came in and out of each other's lives, but mostly out, and I knew, therefore, it would be impossible to tell it from a single perspective. So this is a chapter told from Genick's perspective. Again, he's my great uncle, my grandfather's older brother, who was sent to Siberia. It's August of 1942, and this is actually a year after he's left the gulag. So again, he's been, he's been freed by Stalin, who says, okay, I free you, but on the condition that you must fight for me, because I'm now an ally, and there's an army gathering in Persia, in modern-day Iran, and that's where you need to be. So it takes a year for Genek and his wife Herta and baby Jose to get from Siberia, um, across Russia, Central Asia, Asia, Kazakhstan, over the Caspian Sea, to Tehran where he's told the army is gathering. So he's just arriving in Tehran. He's in the back of a, a truck with a bunch of other ex-prisoners, and they are in tough, tough shape. Um, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it might be something like half of the prisoners that left the Gulag actually made it, uh, you know, with the intention of arriving in Tehran to fight for the army actually made it. They were dying of disease and starvation. Some, some were dying because they were eating food for the first time, and their stomachs couldn't handle it. Um, so they're in tough, tough shape, um, and, and this wasn't a story that was passed down through Genick's children, but one I read about in many, many other first-hand accounts of this experience of arriving in the back of a truck, and that's all I'll say. I'll, I'll, I'll read from here. <clears throat> a second sphere sails overhead, and this time Genick reflexively catches it. Why would the locals taunt such a pitiful-looking group of people, he wonders. But when he opens his hand, he finds an orange. A nice one, too. Fresh. Plump. The first piece of fruit his fingers have touched in over two years. 
He glances over his shoulder to see if he can spot whoever threw it, catching the eye of a young woman wearing a maroon headscarf, standing on the sidewalk with her hands on the shoulders of two young boys in front of her. She smiles, her brown eyes soft and full of pity, and suddenly it's clear. The orange wasn't hurled as a sign of disrespect, it was a gift, sustenance. Genick's eyes well up as he rolls this, the fruit between his palms, a gift. He waves at the Persian woman who waves back and then disappears into a cloud of dust. Genick can't remember the last time a stranger did something nice for him without expecting something in return. He digs a dirty fingernail into the orange, peels it, and hands a wedge to Herta. She bites off a piece and holds what's left of it to Jose's lips, laughing softly as his nose wrinkles. It's an orange, Zay, she offers, a new word for him. Pomaranza. Soon enough, you'll learn to like it. Genick peels off a wedge for himself and closes his eyes as he chews. The flavor explodes on his tongue. It's the sweetest thing he's ever tasted. I read several accounts of, of prisoners, um, first-hand accounts of other prisoners arriving for the first time in Persia and thinking that they're being heckled. And, and they just think these skeletons, and why would people heckle them? And then realizing for the first time in how many years that there were people out there who cared and who wanted to help them. And I just thought that was um, such a beautiful sentiment. I knew I wanted to include it. The second passage is um, verbatim, was passed down through Felicia. Again, my grandfather's young niece, who was a year old at the start of the war. She's maybe just turned five. It's 1943. She, is in, um, she and her mother, Mila, had been living together um, in Warsaw. And Felicia has just had a horrific event occur. And Mila has been forced to make the horrible decision that finally it's time for her daughter to live in someone else's care. She no, doesn't feel like she's capable any longer of keeping her safe. So when she overhears um, word of a convent outside of town accepting young children, she begs the mother superior to accept Felicia. Thankfully, the mother superior does. And, um, and Mila sends Felicia to this convent. <clears throat> Pulling her wool cap low over her brow, Mila strolls along the split rail wooden fence of the convent's garden, trying to make out the faces of the children playing inside. She's allowed one visit per week, but this one is unscheduled. She can't help it. She hates being apart from her daughter. She scans the garden, trying to decipher which of the small bundled bodies is Felicia's. The children look alike in their dark winter coats and hats. They run and shout, their breath puffing in fleeting clouds from pink-lipped mouths as they play. Mila smiles. There's something about the sound of their laughter that fills her momentarily with hope. Finally, she notices a girl, slighter than the rest, standing still, staring in her direction. Mila makes her way casually toward the fence, fighting the urge to wave, to jump the wooden beams, to gather her daughter up in her arms and sneak her back to Warsaw. Felicia approaches the fence, too, her chin cocked, curious as to why her mother has come. She keeps close track and must realize it's too soon for her next scheduled visit. Mila smiles and nods gently. There's no reason to worry, she says with her eyes. Felicia nods, too, in understanding. A stone's throw from her mother, she stops beside a bench, props her foot on it, and bends over as if tying her shoelace. Upside down, her hat falls off and her bleached blonde hair spills toward the earth, haloing her small, freckled face. She peers between her legs at her mother and, knowing the others can't see, waves. I love you, Mila mouths, and blows a kiss. Felicia smiles and returns the kiss. I love you too. Mila watches, blinking back tears, as Felicia stands, adjusts her hat on her head, and trots back to the other children. I couldn't get over the composure and maturity that Felicia had in that moment to not run to her mother. And certainly these scenes became especially challenging to write when I became a mother and could relate for the first time on a maternal level of what that must have entailed. I mean, Mila's whole storyline became very challenging to write. Um, but but that was a memory that Felicia was very sharp in her mind. She remembered that that was her way of waving to her mother by pretending to tie her shoelace. 
Um, and I, it was important to me in the telling of the story um, to capture those lighter moments. You know, it's a Holocaust survival story, and there are certainly the dark pieces um, throughout, but there were also these, these moments of love and tenderness and just very kind of soft, gentle, human moments, and those were the most um, gratifying <laughs> to write, obviously. Um, and I do think that those moments were probably what kept the family going. You know, they lived for those, for those human moments, those little bits of their old lives. So on that light note, <laughs> um, I would love to answer any questions you might have. Yes? We were talking about Felicia, and she was a child when this all transpired, so that was the only reality she knew. How do you think that affected her as a result? I imagine it, it stayed with her. I mean, she, as I said, she was the only relative I was able to interview with, with first-hand memories, and her... There, there were no anecdotes, there was no laughter, that most of the family members I met with, there was, it was very light, it was easy, it was almost, almost to, the, to the extreme, stories passed down with, with energy and humor. This was, there was none of that with Felicia, and I think throughout life, I'm sure she carried it with her. She never spoke about having been traumatized, but I, it, it, she, she must have been. And, you know, you think about your kids and at that young age, and those are her most vivid memories, her first memories being those memories. Um, so she, of the cousins of that generation, is definitely the most reserved, um, but happy and, you know, until recently came to every family reunion and has beautiful children and grandchildren and has seen you know, life go on. So I wouldn't say she's depressed, but I know that for her, those, that experience has stayed with her. Yes. First, I'm thrilled to be in the presence of one of the characters. <laughs> I, know. I know, right? <laughs> I love the story of how I met. Um, how has discovering this part of your ancestry, that you're a quarter Jewish, mm -hmm. how has that affected your personal life? Is it, have you embraced the religion more than you might have? Or what is your life now as a result of this discovery? Sure, good question. I feel like it has certainly brought me closer to the religion and to not so much, um, more to the cultural piece of it. And, and I kind of have these moments where I understand, oh, like that's where the appreciation for this comes from or this trait comes from. Um, just understanding also what the family endured for, for me to be here, for us to be here today, gives me so much perspective, so much appreciation, um, and I feel like it's, it's helped me to just feel more grounded and rooted in who I am. Like I say, I see, it just things all of a sudden become a little bit more obvious, like why I am the way I am, why my children are the way they are, why, you know, why I see traits in my, a lot of all my family members and so that's a very um, you know it's a, it's a special thing I definitely feel I my husband's Episcopalian from the south you know my grandfather married a Presbyterian from the south so there's no decision made about what religion will necessarily raise our children but we will keep the stories alive and keep them we will offer them at a younger age than I was able to understand them so that he's able to really grasp like where he came from Yes. What I also thought was fascinating was, and in terms of reading the book, was how you, and you didn't talk about this much, but how you, after like every chapter, when it was appropriate, you put into context what was going on in the war, mm -hmm. yes. which was yes. extremely helpful because, you know, many times you forget that, you know, Poland was, you know, was, was half, you know, occupied by the Germans and half occupied by Stalin, and then, you know, Stalin, you know, just all those pieces of the war that sometimes you just, don't remember right away or whatever. And that in and of itself must have taken an incredible amount of research. How did you, I mean, was that a separate track of research or how did you do that piece of it? That's a good question. Um, and I, I it was, um, I was doing it all at the same time, but it was really helpful when I was t passed a, down a story, for example, um, of Helena crossing the river to get to Adam. Crossing the dividing river, the Bug River, the divided, the divided 
German and Russian occupied Poland. There wasn't a date that was passed along, but I knew it was cold. So then, okay, I said, what was going on in the winter of that year? And I would look, you know, just, yeah, immerse myself in the history of it. And so in my timeline, um, if I was ever uncertain of when things were happening, I would try to use their stories and then compare it with what was going on in history, um, politically, military, whatever, and, um, and that would help me understand where they were and when. And I'm so glad to say it was helpful to you. I mean, it was a big refresher uh, for me in, in history in that time. And I also was, I liked including those, those historical snippets because it allowed, again, we see it, we have the perspective that they didn't have, you know, the family didn't have at the time. They were just putting one foot in front of the other and trying to stay alive day to day. But um, I didn't want to force that historical context into the story itself. Therefore, I wouldn't want to have to create like headlines or, oh, and then he heard on the radio that the Russians were approaching. So I, I felt it was a nice way to let the story unfold the way it would have with them not really knowing what was going on. I mean, they didn't know the Warsaw Uprising was happening until the, the ghetto was on fire, you know. So, um, so I found it so helpful in my own research that I decided to include it um, in the book. So I'm, gl I'm glad that you approve. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, yeah, just curious, um, what, what happened to your, your grandfather's relatives that remained in, in Rodham? I know you, you talked about his mom and other family members. They, I know you said they were in the ghetto. What happened to them afterwards? They all scattered, and I won't give too much away, but um, thankfully, no, yeah, um, but they were all thankfully able to get out of the ghetto eventually before it was liquidated. Some were in hiding, one was sent to Siberia, some were, um, yeah, posing as Aryan uh, in Warsaw and Krakow, one ended up in a jail in Krakow. I mean, they literally scattered, and wherever they were, they, from my, one of my big takeaways in my research was they always had a plan. So there was always something or some way that they were, something that they were going to do next. And so they really didn't stay in one place for very long. Um, except for the grandparents, Sal and Nahuma, my grandfather's parents, um, they did end up in hiding for a couple of years. But yeah, they, 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 were, they were in multiple cities, multiple continents. Um, and my grandfather was the farthest away, but yeah, they, they scattered. Yes. So, so interesting is that this is very timely in what's happening with Poland and the question of uh, responsibility and to what extent is there a Polish country that can take responsibility or, uh, you know, they, they like to think of themselves all as suffering and all as being, uh, you know, righteous Gentiles. Um, did your family ever talk to you about, you know, how did they view you know, the, the world, wherever they wound up, how did they view, I mean, you mentioned that your grandfather had married an Episcopalian. I heard, um, you know, another analysis, even last year before they had this thing with Poland, that a lot of Polish Jews, you know, they were crypto Jews, or they realized they had Jewish ancestry, but at some point a relative decided it's not worth being hunted down to extinction. Judaism is a great religion, but it doesn't create enough value to justify your life like that. Did you ever get any sense of their views on, on the world and the people they wound up living with? You know, they, there were, I heard stories on kind of both sides of the Polish Jewish experience when they were still there. There was certainly some resentment um, towards the Polish population for either turning Jews in or turning a blind eye. On that same note, there were many Poles who helped my family. So whether it was the nun who took in a um, young Felicia or the peasant couple who took in my great grandparents. So there was also a lot of respect and admiration for those courageous enough to help. And actually the nun, Mila, nominated for a Righteous Among Nations afterwards and she received that award. So I think um, there was a kind of that double-sided between the Poles and the Jews thing going on. And as far as religion goes, you know, I think for my grandfather, what you said is probably part of why he chose to put that piece behind him. He'd seen what it could have, should have done for his family. But the other siblings kept the religion. So today, m the majority of the family, um, especially overseas, is Jewish. And, um, and there is a lot. It's, it's kind of a scary time. And even in Europe, a couple of relatives have left France and moved to Israel. Um, 
so it's, I never thought that this story would um, to feel so kind of timely, you know. The same thing that I did, right, where they said that a lot of Jews who, I mean, a small amount of Jews who stayed in Germany or stayed in Poland, but they realized that if they, you know, if they can't get out and they have to stay there, they can't be Jewish. Practice Jewish, Judaism. Yeah, there are stories about in, in the town of Rodham. Now they actually, this is, I'm very proud of this town because they actually hold a remembrance every year where they discuss and learn about the Polish Jewish history of this this particular town and they every year there's like another person that kind of comes out oh well yeah I, I am Jewish they've been living there for 70 years maybe as a grandmother and on her deathbed and she has, I just discovered my grandmother is Jewish so I think it's very much a thing my family didn't so much because half most of the family kept the religion my grandfather just wasn't a topic of conversation in our in the house growing up the, Maybe they thought, well, their plans will always change, and you know, the world around them will always change. So, part of their plan, meaning, well, you see, like they didn't stay in one place like they thought about planning, but they realized though that there are a lot of things that they can't control, and right. that might be part of it. Yeah, they had some sort of insight, enough insight to think, if we stay, we're put. We're, you know, our chances are even lower of surviving. So, yeah, they did always have a plan. Yes. It's a novel. Yes. <laughs> that goes back to my, because I didn't inter get a chance to interview these relatives firsthand, Jacob, Mila, Helena, my grandfather, so all the stories were passed down through second generation. I didn't feel comfortable putting words in their mouths and thoughts in their hearts. But the whole story really is based on truth. People do call it a memoir. <laughs> we decided as a team. It just wasn't, if I had, like Laura Hillenbrand that did, did Unbroken, she got to sit with Louis Zamperini, I think his name is, yeah, for like months and months, and, in, and just get every detail of his experience through his own memories. That I understand, but for me, I just, I wasn't there, I wasn't even close to there. I just didn't feel comfortable saying, this is exactly the way it was said you know, or what exactly Mila was thinking at the time. I had to imagine that, so. But there's a big based on true events in the beginning. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. Why do you think they buried the, the stories? So prior to you unearthing them all, it sounds like they didn't talk about it that much, and yet they were such significant events. Why do you think that is? Oh, it's a great question. I wish I could ask my grandfather, why didn't we talk about this more? Um, you know, I think it's a hard time to relive. Um, and even though the story ended happily for my family, you know, it's not like it's something you want to shout from the rooftop. So we were the lucky one, you know, we survived. Um, and I just think the family in general was very forward thinking and they got to Brazil or the States or France and they started with nothing and they just had to create lives and professions and build their families and some of it probably was just like this is our new life we've put this piece of us behind us but that's a question I wish I could ask the relatives of why that why there were not more stories but there were there were I mean there, clearly there were some stories passed down because I, I was able to gather them just my grandfather in particular was, and I think part of that was he ended up in the States, you know, not close to any siblings in a very white American town um, with no Jews, uh, versus the rest of the family, a lot of them at one point were all in Brazil, three generations living together. You know, when you live in the same home as your grandparents and you, they're, they were practicing Judaism, and so then it was a little bit easier to share those stories. And so I think they were talked about a bit more for, with the, my grandfather's other siblings. Uh, the other question I want to ask you is yeah. the amethyst. Yes. Is there really an amethyst? The, I don't know if it was amethyst, but there were definitely jewels and there was definitely silver. And they did every, used every little last piece from like the gold coins that they sewed into their, you know, covered to look like buttons. But they were very resourceful with setting aside and hiding and using everything they had. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. 
Did you have a writing background before you took on this huge project, or did the story inspire you to become a writer? Um, story definitely inspired me to write a book. I've um, always loved to write and had it, sort of treated it more as a hobby, but took classes and writing workshops, and then before beginning this work, I, and I still write as a copywriter in the world of travel, so I'll write marketing materials for adventure travel outfitters. Very different thing, although you can argue it's a lot of um, setting a scene. Um, so this definitely, I, you, if you had asked me if it would come to this, I would have laughed. I mean, I had no idea really the intention was to capture the story for the family, for the relatives, to honor them, and then for my kids and so on. So um, I think uh, most of it just came from the heart. It was a, a labor of love in the best possible way. <laughs> yes? And being able to make like split second decisions like that, and I and I do I, that's there's a lot of ingenuity and a lot of courage, and I do also think that that's where the luck piece comes in as well because they made those decisions, but who is to say that that it wouldn't end poorly? That could have gone either way. That's a perfect example. That could have gone either way, um, but yeah, that was hearing her tell that story. Yeah, that was a. One. Yes. Did you consider any other titles for the book? You know, I first considered just the lucky ones, and then it was the eternal ones for a while, but I didn't like that. Um, and then once I was recalling the, I don't know if you've read the author's note, but this was like verbatim from Felicia's mouth. Yeah, so at that reunion on Martha's Vineyard when we were sitting around talking, um, Felicia said, we should not be here today. It's a miracle that we're all here. We were the lucky ones. And as I was writing, the, like, the authors, I was like, we were the lucky ones. That just seems so appropriate, so. Oh, thank you. I, I feel so good about it. I wasn't a big fan of the eternal ones, and then um, the lucky ones just felt a little too simplified, so the fact that it's from, her, from Felicia's heart. Right, which I thought was great. When I read that, I felt, of course, that she that's good. But I wonder, just in your own mind, like, if you ever, you know, if you thought of other oh, titles. Right? I don't, you know, does a writer have a title? Like, how does a title evolve? Or do they oh, you should see my, my document of other ideas, my titles. <laughs> um, and we had a lot of fun thinking of other, but this was just sort of the clear winner. Um, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. Addie and Alisa. No, no, this is a stock photograph. I tried really hard to get them to use a real photo, but because it's a novel, they felt strongly about um, it, it not being a family member. Um, but I have lots of photos of them on my website, um, on my blog, if you go to We Were the Lucky Ones or GeorgiaHunterAuthor.com, and you can search by name, and you can see some family photos and documents. Actually, I documented all of my research, really, from the beginning, so that I could keep the fam family um, up to date with what kind of findings I was making and what, you know, reflections and things like that. So my blog has tons and tons of photographs. I'll show you guys one more before we wrap up. And this was a picture from um, my book launch, my hardcover launch back last February. It came out on Valentine's Day. And just to, um, as an example of how much support and love I got from the family, I extended an invite out of courtesy to the cousins of my mom's generation to, to join me for my launch event in New York City. I was like so nervous and excited and it would, you know, it had been nine years in the making and, and yet I said, you will all be there in spirit. I just want you to know this is what it's happening and 22 of them showed up. <laughs> <laughs> of the five Kirk siblings, four were there um, for that event, and represented by their children, 
grandchildren and even a great grandbaby. So this was a, a small portion of that group the following day at my home in Connecticut where we um, gathered for a reunion. And you can see, here's the Jose, the Siberian baby. And you know his father, Ginnick, is the very handsome and charming one. And he really characterizes, I, I kind of built him off of um, Jose. This is Jose's younger brother, Michel, with his wife, Tanya, Halina, and Adam's two children, Ricardo, who I think is a lot like Adam, and Anna, who is a lot like Halina. My grandfather's three children, my mom, boop. <laughs> uh, my uncle Tim, who lives in Vermont, my aunt Kath, who lives in California, and Michelle, uh, Michelle and Tanya, their daughter Julia and grandbaby Dora. And I've got little baby brother in my belly there who just turned one a couple days ago. <laughs> my dad in the middle there. So, so anyways, I thought that would be a nice way to wrap up with with the family photo. <laughs> Thank you.